Hey you guys, uh, it's been a while since we've done an informal chit chat here on YouTube. So I thought we could go over some questions that you had, talk about life, talk about parenthood, and talk about investing, investing for your kids too. You gave me a lot of questions about that. So let's go ahead and jump into those questions. Okay, first cue, how do you balance everything? Work, personal life, self-care. Honestly, I should not be a poster child for balance in life, maybe, I don't know, I probably overdo it. But the way that I kind of look at it is just basic time management. And I feel like as a parent, your time management only gets better and better, especially if you're self-employed. If you're self-employed and you have a child, like holy cow, time management is definitely an important skill to master. And so when I'm thinking about work and my personal life and self-care, I have to look at my day in chunks of time. I found that my most productive hours in the day are between 8.30 and 11.30 a.m. That is the window of time where I'm getting the most work done and I'm focused only on work. Then I have lunch and then I'm typically between the hours of like 2 and 4 p.m. I'm working on chores, I'm working out, I'm kind of getting household admin stuff and exercise out of the way. And then when I have Quinn, you know, from when I pick her up from daycare to the time that she goes to bed around 7.30, after that is when I really focus on self-care or sometimes I'll allow for Flex Fridays, which is one of the benefits of being able to work for yourself is that you can build in these flexible work schedules. So Flex Fridays really gives me the opportunity to not only get things done around the house, but really provide opportunities for me to connect back with myself. So I'll do things like doodle in a sketchbook, journal, read for pleasure, go to the pool, go to the beach, go get a boba tea, things like that that really help me reset. And one thing that I do consistently for reset self-care stuff is like take a hot bath. <laughs> So I, I do take a lot of frequent baths, which I used to not do, but now that I have a soaker tub, I feel like, ugh, this is just what I could do with a glass of wine and a good book, and it's all good. All right, moving on. How much should a parent contribute to a 529? Very opposite from what I just answered. Okay, so I, it really depends, right? I think first and foremost, when we're talking about contributions into investing accounts and a 529 plan is specifically for your child and to help cover the costs of education. And now that's really opened up not only for college, but for K through 12 expenses as well. I think it really depends on your budget. And first I would really prioritize Definitely your debt, definitely your emergency fund, and then also your own retirement and investing needs. You have to take care of yourself first before you can take care of those costs for your child. So personally, and do not use this as a benchmark, I just wanna share because in the sake of transparency and being open with you personally, Kyle and I put $100 per month towards Quinn's 529 plan. And then we also opened up that account with a starting balance of $3,000, so we had $3,000 thousand dollars in savings that we were setting aside for various things and we said you know what actually we could take this extra money that we have left over and move it over to open up a 529 plan for her all right 529 per child or 529 per family now this really needs to be per child because you can only have one beneficiary per 529 plan next Question, what if your child ends up not wanting to go to college? Can I withdraw or transfer funds? You can absolutely transfer funds. So there's really two options that I see if your child does not end up going to college. If you know this early enough, you could just go ahead and use some of those expenses to help pay for you know, their last year of high school. Or if they end up going to a trade school, you could still use it because it's education expenses. You could also just change the beneficiary to another child or even to yourself or to another family member. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a child, but 
It could also be a niece or nephew. Another thing that you can do, which is new to the 529 plan rules and laws, is that you can actually transfer that money into a Roth IRA for your child. So instead of using it for education expenses, you can use it to help build up their retirement account, which I think is such a fantastic change. I love seeing that as part of the 529 plan rule. Okay. 529 or brokerage account for child. Now, honestly, I think a use of both would be really fun because then you would have the 529 to cover those education expenses, and then you could have the brokerage account to do whatever the f you want. So that would be things like putting money towards a down payment, paying for their wedding, helping them pay for a new car. Maybe you use it as a starter investing to help them with a business, a new startup business business idea, the sky's the limit with a brokerage account. And so I really think having the flexibility of the brokerage account for your child could be really exciting. So it's more of the fun stuff, whereas the 529 is like, the boring but necessary stuff, I suppose, like we wanna be able to pay for their education. So the next question I got after that was, if I have a brokerage account, does it make sense to open up one for my child too? This is a really good question and one that I didn't really think about because if you already have the brokerage account set up with you as the owner, then technically, yeah, you could just continue to build up those funds and say part of this is for my own goals and then another small part of this is for my child and I wanna be able to withdraw that money at any time and place. Just know that you will be paying capital gains tax on any withdrawals that you make with that account and so that's just something to keep in mind. You could also do a, a UGMA account and then if you were to do that, the Uniform Gifts to Minors Act account, where you can use those funds for whatever you want, you name, you're the custodian of that account, so you own it. And then once your kid gets to the legal age, it depends on states, it's either 18 years old or 21 years old, depending on what state you're in. Once they become of legal age, then they retain ownership of that account. So if you're going to do this path, which is really fantastic in its own right, you really wanna make sure that that your child is equipped to understand how personal finance works. Are you actually implementing financial literacy for that child ahead of time so they know exactly what they can do with this money once they retain ownership? Now, if you haven't checked out my Investing for Kids activity book, which is available for on Amazon, that is the perfect tool for you to start educating your child on the use of money, using money as a tool, and seeing how they can make useful things, build things in their lives with money. So be sure to check out that activity book on Amazon. I will leave a link in the description box for you to check out. Okay, best place to better understand 529s. There is a fantastic ultimate guide to 529 plans listed at thecollegeinvestor.com. This is something that I helped collaborate with in a very, very small part, but this guide is amazing. Robert Farrington and his team of writers really put this together a few years ago, but they update it consistently and they are checking every single state's plan. And so you can check that out per by state. You can go into your state and figure out what 529 plans are available to you, or you don't even have to go state specific. So for us, we ended up opening a 529 plan with Vanguard instead of through the state's program, but there are benefits to opening up state specific 529 plans, especially if your state offers a tax deduction on those contributions. Not all states do. That's why you should definitely check out that ultimate guide. I will leave a link to that article in the description box below. Speaking of books, when's the next book coming? <laughs> this is such a good question. It's really been on my heart to do another one because I had such a great experience writing the first book, the Investing for Kids activity book. And so there's really kind of two two options that I think about when it comes to writing the next book. One is a money book for toddlers, so I wanna do a toddler board book because I really wanna be able to start introducing money as a concept to my own daughter, and she's only two years old, but I feel like this is such a an easy thing, like how can I make it very easy for her to understand things about money, introducing that concept to her and to other toddlers. So this book would be for like two and three year olds. 
maybe two, two to four year olds. The other one that I really want to write is like an everyday finance book where it's for us, it's for you, where we're talking about you know, savings, debt, investing, kind of my philosophy on how to enjoy life and how to spend on your guilty pleasures without guilt, how to find fun by building financial confidence that leads to less payments. So I'm also toying with that idea. Which idea is your favorite? Do you like the toddler board book about money or do you like the everyday finance for millennials idea? Leave me a comment below and let me know which one you, you like better. Okay, next one. I'm scared to buy a house right now with the market and interest rates. Kind of feel like I missed the boat in 2020 when the rates were lower. Thoughts? Dude, do you remember 2020 with the pandemic and everything? Even though the interest rates were crazy low, oh my God, the housing market was crazy hot. People were paying 40, 50, 60K over asking. So yes, you get lower interest rates, but wow, were people just outbidding just it was just insane especially when I was living in San Diego at that time it just even our best offer which was like 50k over asking was still not getting accepted because things were just going gangbusters so yeah we missed the boat on the interest rate but to me really when I am ready to buy a house, you gotta remember, you really can't time the market because buying a house is such a personal decision. It's such a personal decision because it impacts you know, your location, your livelihood, and your family. If you're thinking about expanding your family, then you're going to want to get into a house that can accommodate you know, your entire situation with babies and things like that. And so, I know the right house is going to find me when I'm ready for that. And no matter if the interest rates are 6% or they're 2%, I know that I can't time the market when I'm ready to make that purchase. And I feel comfortable with the down payment and I know exactly what those monthly mortgage payments look like, that house is going to present itself to me. Maybe that's a completely wrong way to view this, but that's kind of how I'm looking at that situation. So don't don't feel bad about that, because I don't. Where do you think paying off mortgage should fit in with goals, especially with interest rates being so high? Okay, so when I'm thinking about paying off the mortgage fast, I'm really only thinking about doing that when I'm in a house that I know I want for life, like 20 years plus. If I'm in a house where I know uh, it's not my most ideal location or, hey, this is not going to accommodate us if we decide to have another baby, then paying off the mortgage fast is just probably not a good idea. Like I would not do that. It just doesn't make sense. With interest rates being so high and you're thinking about paying off the mortgage, maybe you wait until the interest rates drop to refinance. If you refinance you know, from 6% to 3%, I'd say that's a really great deal. You could go ahead and do that. Just keep in mind when you're refinancing, you'll have to pay for closing costs again on that. And so it's just kind of a numbers game. And the only way that I would think about paying off the mortgage is if I'm in a home where I'm like, this is my dream home. I wanna keep it forever this is long term for me and this is what we're going to do to make it happen if you think like this is not the right home for you if you could see yourself in another place if you think you could see yourself changing jobs that has you moving you know not even out of state but even across town so you could be closer to work then don't pay off the mortgage fast how do you recommend balancing retirement savings with short and midterm savings goals Okay, so the, the key here, and when I think about retirement contributions and also my short to midterm savings goals, is I never compromise my retirement com contributions in order to hit those savings goals. So the retirement contributions stay the same. I never mess with that. That does not get f***ed with, okay? So you're gonna going to keep those retirement contributions the same, and then whatever's in your budget and your take home pay, whatever discretionary income you have left over, that's going to satisfy the short and midterm goals. But something that Kyle and I have been working on 
is slowly maxing out those retirement accounts. So we really started with Kyle's 401k and his thrift savings plan. We worked to max that out to the max contribution limit of $22,500. So that was kind of step one. Once we got used to that new paycheck amount, because that's you know offered as a deduction, and then we'll get whatever's left over. Once we got comfortable with that, then we could see what else was left over for those short and midterm goals. And when this person says short or midterm savings goals, to me, those are things like a vacation, a replacement car, maybe furniture, that sort of thing. So really, we're talking about material possessions <laughs> and, and all of those, except for vacation, that's more experience, which I'm totally, totally okay with saving for experiences and those types of goals. But really, like, I wanna make sure that I'm investing, maxing those out inch by inch, but also making sure that my budget accommodates for those fun experiences and some of those material possessions that we definitely like to have. Hope that answers that. That's how I would view it. I'd never compromise the retirement contributions for those savings goals. All right, next question, self-care ideas. As a new mom, I don't know even how to care for myself anymore. First off, can I just give you a big hug because you're doing great. And as a new mom, it is so difficult to navigate the things that you used to do for yourself as an independent woman. It, before kids, you could just do things on your own time and do what feels good in the moment. And now the baby comes first, like all of their basic needs need to be met. So what I do is I actually have a notes in, in my phone, I have the notes app and I keep a list, a running list of self-care activities. I'm actually going to share that with you so that you can get an idea of what feels good to you. And it could be as simple as taking a bath. I mentioned taking a bath earlier. That's one of my self-care activities and something that I can easily do after my baby goes to bed. Okay, my mama self-care reset list. Hot bath, lighting a candle, sleep, just prioritizing sleep, talking to your partner about that and saying like, I just need a full nine hours of sleep. Can you get up with them tonight? Can you get up with them in the morning? Being alone, watching my own shows, reading pedicure, boba tea, Starbucks, messaging hypno mamas, which is my group of moms that I met on the internet. <laughs> I've actually met them in real life too. Uh, those who were also committed to hypnobirthing, which is what I did when I gave birth and what, which helped me achieve a completely unmedicated birth. So like we have a group together, messaging them, calling my mom, texting my mom friends, being outside, going for a slow walk, working out, running, yoga, meditation, beach time. Like all of these things are on my reset self-care list so that I can know if anytime I'm feeling anxious or if I feel like I've not prioritized myself, doing an activity from that reset list really just takes care of those needs and kind of like gets me back to myself in a way. All right, last question. How did you find a publisher to publish your book? It's my life goal to be a published author. First of all, I love that your life goal is to be a published author. It had always been on my mind to write a book. I think I knew this, easily I knew this in fourth grade. When I was 10 years old, I wrote a story and it was really cool because our classroom actually got to write a story and then it was, we got to illustrate it and then they actually printed and bound it in a hardcover book that we could take home. I still remember that and I wanna say it was like a mystery. I wrote some sort of like mystery book and I knew at that time since that project that I was destined to write something. I just didn't know that the Investing for Kids activity book would be the first book to get me published as an author. To answer your question though, I was really fortunate that the publisher actually reached out to me via cold email. Never heard of this publishing company, never heard of their concept of how they worked with first time authors. And they reached out to me and I asked them how they found me and they said, uh, basically Google SEO search is working really well for you. So I was like, okay. Uh, but for you, I would say Google and literally type this into Google, literary agents for blank writers or authors. So you're gonna fill in the blank with like literary agents for personal finance writers, literary agents for 
children's authors, you know, children's book authors. And so kind of see what pops up and works best for you and start making a short list. Or another idea is to look at authors in the genre that you want to write about or books that are similar to the book that you want to write about. Look up what publishing company that they're with or are they self-published? Those are some avenues that you could go in as well. And I think for me this next time around, I have no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> like, because the book that I wrote with that publishing company was kind of like a one and done. I don't know if I could approach them. I guess I could. I guess I could approach them again, but I'm also kind of of the idea of like, what if I went the self-publishing route, which has its own benefits, where maybe I can retain more royalties in that regard. So yeah, there's just, I think going into the world of becoming an author and a writer just opens up so many opportunities and avenues that really can not only boost your income with book royalties and that sort of thing, but also if you have other offerings or other things that you're doing, it can really boost your credibility as a speaker, a coach, a a creator, maybe even within your industry. If you're working as a manager, how can that scale you up? You know, I've written a book about this leadership stuff and now I can actually see myself moving up into the next position. That'd be really cool. All right, so that's investing, books, book writing, work-life balance a little bit. I hope that you find these conversations with me really enjoyable. I love talking with you here and just being open and very transparent. That's always been 100% my goal with this channel is just being transparent, not only about money, but just how things are going as a millennial woman who's also now a mom, who's also now like trying to figure out home buying and all of those other things that you're probably also dealing with as well. So thank you so much for being here. If you like this video, give it a big thumbs up. Don't forget to share this with a friend and see how we can grow this community even stronger. It's my goal to hit 100,000 subscribers. Can you imagine? 100,000 subscribers for Debt Free Millennials would be huge because we are building a community of unwavering financial confidence for millennials that leads to more fun and less payments. I'll catch you in the next one.